the stage, Mike Arce. Man, this is, you know what's crazy? So, you know how, I don't know if anybody does talks, but you have to practice the first thing you're going to say. And you're like, how do I open it up and do a joke? And so I was going to open it up with a stock. What a great room. But in reality, this actually is a really cool room. This is wide. We've got TVs everywhere. And I can't even believe, like, look, there's like, how many monitors do we have here? Alex does everything big. So um, I've been following Alex and Layla on Instagram, especially the last week. And I've got to say, um, I've been watching. You guys have barely been sleeping. You've been staying up late at night. You've been waking up early mornings. I don't think so. Alex slept yesterday. So you guys have probably done it a bunch of times. But one more time for me, because I didn't see a round of applause for them for the doing something. When they asked me to come down and speak on uh, marketing and sales, I was actually very, very honored and flattered because I think Alex and Layla are just incredible at it. And their whole entire gym launch team, they just they know their stuff. I know people that, I know some of you guys and, and you have great things to say. And uh, I was very, very honored. So Alex, thank you. Layla, thank you very much. Um, so I wanted to make sure I delivered a really, really great talk and something fresh, something you guys may not have heard before especially when it comes to a topic that Alex hits on very, very hard. And uh, so I started asking Layla some questions behind the scenes, wanting to understand a little bit more about who you guys are and how you guys think and how you guys work. And, you know, I got to the point where I was like, are they competitive? And she's like, yeah, they're competitive, especially like, you know, there's this group here that's like very competitive people that are kicking ass in here. So is Layla honest? Are you guys pretty competitive here? Yeah? Okay, cool. I was like, what else? What else is, is this group like? And, Label was like, they really like helping people. They like making an impact. They don't just, they didn't pick fitness because it's an open market, because clearly it's not. They picked this industry because they love making an impact in this way. So why did I choose 10 year challenge? When Layla was talking to me and I was talking with Alex and, and you know, we had a great conversation at uh, the digital marketer office, I don't know, it was like four or five months ago, something like that. I really got to know them. When they asked me to do this, you know, we started really digging into sales and uh, they wanted me to talk about a few different things. Alex had a few things he wanted me to really get into. And so I realized, well, my 10-year challenge is really when I learned a lot of this stuff. It's really a, a lot, of, all of it's all over the last 10 years. And so uh, this is actually my 10-year challenge. Uh, you can see 2009 is actually when I started my company in 2019. Which one do you think was more broke? <laughs> Just by posture. <laughs> so uh, 2009, the funny thing is, even though I had nothing working for me, I actually thought I knew how to sell. I was convinced, and it was because I had people like my aunts and my uncles and friends and family members and coworkers that would say things like, man, you're such a good talker, you're so good with your words, or you know, you've got the gift of gab, and all these things for people that actually don't sell for a living, but I started buying it in, so I'm, I'm getting brainwashed, so I'm getting cocky, and none of this actually came from education, just from me being you know, outgoing and me being enthusiastic, I had those things, and articulate, kind of, depending on the situation. And I would walk around saying things like, man, I can sell ice to an Eskimo. Please, make me feel like I'm not alone. Raise your hands if you've been cocky and arrogant enough to at least one time in your life say, I can sell ice to an Eskimo. You know you're sitting at a table with someone that said it. Raise your hands. <laughs> Be honest. All right. And I would say a bunch of stuff like that, as well as I can sell ketchup popsicles to a man in white gloves, wings to a bird, sand to a beach, water to a well, honey to a bee. And then I learned. Eskimos just don't freaking eat ice. So I also realized that I sounded like a complete idiot to any salespeople that were actually listening to me, any real salespeople, because that's not what it's about. Sales is not about convincing someone to buy something they do not want or need. It's about motivating somebody to do something that they actually want to do. But their fear, their doubt, and self-talk, and the society and friends around them kind of tricking them and getting them in the, the way. Fear can be disguised in many, many ways. And most people think it's reasons that stop them from doing things. And then they deliver them in the form of excuses. Now, I want to go into this because this is very important for you to understand on, on three different levels. One, what your prospects are saying. Two, what your customers are saying. And three, what your employees are saying. You could even say number four, what sometimes you might be saying to yourself as well. For example, man, I wish I could work out. But, oh, my schedule with work, I can't get out of the work enough time, or I gotta go home and make dinner, or, oh, I got the kids, and I got, I got all these kids, or I'm not a morning person, I can't wake up in the morning. How many of you guys have heard these things before? 
Okay. Now, the worst part about it is birds of a feather. So all their friends are there justifying them, saying, I know, I know. I mean, with little Cindy in dance class, I can never make it to the gym. Oh, I know, waking up in the morning, I'm just not meant to do that. I'm a night person too. And what happens is our, our other birds make us feel normal, and therefore we're justified and we're right in our way of thinking. In reality, that's not the way it is. Because what happens when you get a real winner in the room, a get shit done person in the room, when they hear someone says, I'm not a morning person, what does that guy say? Just get the hell up. Everyone's a morning person, I can prove it. You take a person that's not a morning person, get a line to walk in that room, that guy bounces the hell up. Right or wrong? You, you just need to want to get up. Line walks in, you want to get up? Maybe you want to lay down, I don't know. The point is, you're immediately awake. So, when a winner hears it, it's, it's, it's BS. I don't know if I'm allowed to. Uh, so I'm just kidding. Whatever the fuck you want. It, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think I can curse once too. I asked for permission after. It's too cool. Um, so, we want to understand this because what we're going to be talking about today is more mindset around the sales. The tactics, the strategies, all these things, the reason people fail at sales is not because they're saying the wrong things, it's because their mindset behind what they're saying is so incorrect that the behavior when they're delivering the message isn't working for them. It's like a comedian. You can say a joke, I can say a joke, but if you're a comedian and you know how to deliver it, you're actually going to make them laugh and I'm not going to do it. Does that make sense? How many of you know friends that no matter what they say, it's funny, and other people, no matter what they say, it's not? Delivery is very important, and that happens from true believing, right? Actors know how to believe, they believe. And so you guys really want, I want you to understand this stuff. So when people are telling me stuff, you're not buying it. So at that time, I had a rebuttal for every, every sales objection in the book, and some of them I had like two or three. I had them all in notebooks, and I remember there was nothing you could hit me with that I didn't have a, a, a rebuttal for, that I believed could close anyone. And I was making money, so for me, I was justified that I was actually that good as well. And this all happened between 2003 and 2007. You guys remember 2003 to 2007? Okay, it was a pretty good time. But then, 2008 to 2010 came. You guys remember 2008 to 2010? Very different time. Raise your hands if that was tough for you guys. It's very tough, right? If you know what you're doing, you crave a down economy because you know everyone else is going out of business and everything's for sale. If you don't know what you're doing, you'll find out quick that you don't know what you're doing. I found out real quick and <laughs> didn't know what I was doing. Uh, all of a sudden, all these foolproof rebuttals, things that just worked, no matter what I did, it just worked, everything worked, all of them just stopped working. Nothing worked anymore. I wasn't making sales. I was, I was making 10 to 12K a month at the time, managing a sales store, I dropped down to 2,500 a month. And it, and it was my base, basically. And not only was I not selling ice to Eskimos, I couldn't even sell ice to Alex for his knees, knees after leg day. <laughs> Do you know how much ice his knees probably need after leg day? He couldn't, I couldn't close him on that probably. It's a joke, Alex, I envy your legs. <laughs> These skinny jeans are bad. <laughs> Eventually enough was enough. And I decided to become a student of sales. And uh, I've got an awesome library, and, and you know, the more you read, the more books get recommended to you. You guys notice that? Because books will recommend books. And people that start reading the same books, people they recommend books, and I can't, I can't keep up. And right now I'm almost at 300, and that's not a race or anything, I'm just into it now, I love it. And about 80 of those books were sales. Because as you guys know, uh, as business owners, you gotta know all, a little bit at least about a lot of stuff, whether it's HR, PR, marketing, advertising, leadership, culture development. I mean, it's this endless process and systems. So sales is something I really, really fell in love with because I felt like I already had a little bit of a head start. I just needed structure around it. So after I started reading a lot, how many of you guys, after you, like when you read your first book, you believed everything that book said? And on your hundredth book, you doubted most of what the book said. You guys there with me? Okay. So I really started catching on little by little, and I realized, okay, well, there's a lot of contradicting things here that seem to be opinion, but then there's some standards. These things, everyone's saying, this is the way it is. So the main thing that I learned is that most of the rebuttals I had in my pocket for all these various objections, they were absolutely worthless. There's really only two reasons that people do not buy. That's it. Just two. You guys know what they are? They don't like you? What else? 
Don't trust you. What else? Don't trust your product. They believe they can do it on their own. Okay. You can kind of fall them under the umbrella if you want to bend it. But these are the two reasons. You guys want to know what they are? Okay. Number one, they're not the decision maker. You're talking to the wrong person. Okay. They don't have a credit card. They don't have access to it. They don't even. They can't even take something out of their pocket because they don't do it. Okay. Now, just so you know. There is still a way to get around this, kind of, and I'll go into that with you. But just so you know, if you can't get around it, this is a legitimate reason, right? You don't want to get people in trouble with their marriage, necessarily. And number two, they're not certain it'll work. That's it. I'm not certain it's going to work. Nothing else matters. At the end of the day, if you're certain something's going to work and you want that result, not too much, you're going to do it anyway. I know people that actually don't like Apple, but yeah, I got it too because it's good. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it, you're still going to get it. So at the end of the day, though, it'll can be defined in four main categories. Number one, I'm not sure if that product or service is going to work. Meaning, I don't know if that type of fitness works. I don't know, it seems more like a trend than anything else. I don't know if that program or that training works. Okay? Or, yeah, I know that type of fitness works, but I just don't know if that company is good. I don't know if they're like a good fit. I, they seem a little, like they don't know what they're doing. Okay? Or, yeah, I know this type of training works. I know this company is good. I know people that work out there. I see the reviews. But man, my, my lifestyle, my schedule, I just don't know if it can work in my life right now, in my schedule. And lastly, man, I know the training is good. I know this company is a, is a great company. And I know it can fit into my lifestyle. But man, I keep quitting stuff. I don't know if I'll work. I have my own self-doubt, right? I don't know if it'll work because of me. So you need to be able to overcome these things. If you have not overcome these things, and they're not certain it's going to work, they will not buy. You've heard an uncomfortable mind doesn't buy? Well, what creates a lot of discomfort is lack of certainty. Lack of certainty will create a lack of confidence. And when that doesn't exist, you will not buy. How many of you guys uh, saw a ton of content from Alex before you actually reached out to the gym launch to get started? Okay. And when you look at his content, what's the majority of his content in, in the main part of his funnels? Testimonials, case studies, proof. Why? What does that bring? Certainty. It brings certainty. Alex knows how to sell. He understands it's not about all the hoopla. I need to just show you I can do it. It's done. We got a room full of people. We got, and this isn't even everyone. We've got tons of people that's working for it. Not only is it great to have that kind of stuff for your prospects so they can want to sign up, but it's also great for your customers because there's people that are a part of Gym Launch that maybe it wasn't like clicking right away. I know I get the same thing in my community. It's not clicking right away in the beginning, but because they see it works for so many people, fortunately, that certainty allows the smart people to start thinking first, well, what am I doing wrong? Right? Because clearly it works. Like, it's, it's not this, people are talking, it works. Right? So how can we start doing this in your business as well to start bringing that certainty? I mean, take something from Alex's books. He does a great job of it. Mainly it comes down to fear. Um, fear stops people from doing a lot of things. And when we're not certain, we get a little scared. So as far as the decision maker, I'll give you something that kind of, that, that when I say kind of works, I mean because it works maybe like 20% of the time, but it's better than zero. How many of you guys get that where they're like, oh, I got to go home and talk to my wife, or I got to go home and talk to my husband? Raise your hands if you get that. Okay, I'm going to give you something that will bump up your conversion rates. Don't expect 100% close rates, a legitimate excuse, reason. Let me give you guys something that will help bump it up. Okay, here we go. Hey, so what do you think? Did you like the workout? Everything good? Yeah, it was awesome. Could you see yourself getting the results here like I can? Yes, 100%, definitely. Okay, great. So what do we have to do to get started? Are we good? Well, I do want to talk to my husband first. Hey, I totally get it. I like to do stuff like that in my house too sometimes. Um, can I ask you a serious question though? Yes. And be honest with me? Yes. Do you really want to work out here? Yeah, I do. I do. 100%. Yes. Okay. Well, if your husband says you can't do it, are you going to do it anyway? Now, what do you think some people are going to say? Not all. What do you think some people are going to say? Oh, yeah. Probably. Oh, yeah. I'll probably do it. Okay. Well, why don't we just do it now? And if you do it today, to be part of this, let's get it done now uh, uh, mode that, that we got here, I'll actually knock off this percentage. I'll also throw in a couple bonuses, pass this for your friends, and I'll hook up your husband with a couple things too. What do you think? Again, this isn't the, uh, this isn't the easy one, 
you're looking to get five more people that you wouldn't have got this month from the people that said, I got to talk it over with my wife. This counts as a legitimate um, re a reason that somebody can't buy. Does that make sense to you guys? So you guys remember what to say here? If he says you can't do it, I can do it anyway. You're going to actually see a lot of people laugh and just say yeah. Okay? The words that you use will 100% impact your sale. I get a lot of people that ask me questions like, what do I do when somebody says I don't have the money? What do I do when somebody says I don't have the time? What do I do when somebody says this or that or that? Dude, most of the time, you lost it over there. You didn't lose the game in the last few seconds. You lost the game because your first quarter, second quarter, and third quarter sucked. Had you played a better first half, your final shot might not have been necessary. You would have closed them in the third quarter, and they would have sent in the reserves. You get what I'm saying? So the words that you use are important. How many of you guys have heard of neuro-linguistic programming or NLP? Okay, how many of you guys have actually taken the time to really study and see how the whole thing works? Okay, neuro-linguistic programming is the mind and the, and the mouth, and the, you know, really communicating together to be able to get you to hear something a certain way. By the way, you can look at it as manipulative or you can look at it as the exact opposite. The way I look at it is the world has manipulated most people's minds as it is. And my job is to demanipulate the nonsense that's going on as to why they can't afford a gym membership today, but they got a $35,000 SUV outside. Does that make sense? The world messed up. So words like try, this word is not allowed in my office. In fact, so opposite of Alex, Alex, Alex's company and my company do similar things but different. This is his try, the gym, the training, the group training, that kind of stuff. Mine's the fitness studios, but really sales is sales. Business is business, right? And he gets to work virtually. A lot of you guys are all over, like I met people that work at Gym Launch from Indiana and Dallas, and it's really cool. And my company, they all come into the office, right? And in my office, this word isn't allowed. In fact, when it's said, somebody gets flipped over a pink, yellow tea pillow, and they have to clip it to their shirt until somebody else says it, and then they get to get rid of it and give it to that person. <laughs> this word's not allowed to be said because it's the weakest word you can use. There's a lot of tests on it I could share with you another time. For the sake of time, it's just no, it's a real, real weak word. And this goes for other words like might be, could be, probably, should be, can't, all that stuff, right? These are ways to not necessarily commit to a decision or an idea. It's a way to commit to the effort, and that's not the same, okay? So when you say words like try, which, by the way, a lot of you guys say in very unnecessary situations, and you're creating weakness in you, which creates lack of confidence in them, in you. For example, yeah, so... You know, what we want to try to do here every week is we want to try to get your results, you know, at least one to two pounds off every week. And then what we're going to try to do is get you up the trainer that really understands your needs. And, you know, even if you just try to make it in here three to four times a week, um, that's great. You know, it's, the most important thing is that you try. Bullshit, that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is that you get it done, right? Everyone's trying, just the level of tries up in here and down, right? So we eliminate the word try, as well as all the other words. We do not speak in gray, black, and white. What's Yoda's phrase? Do or do not. Right? I never even watched Star Wars, but I know that. So here's the thing, though. First step is get rid of these words and never use it. It's a curse word to me. You know when you walk around, like when you hear the F word, even if you curse regularly, when you hear the F word, you hear the F word, right? It's a curse word. For me, if I hear the word try, anybody on my team, like you can say it, it's a bit weird, but when I hear it, I'm like, boom, I heard it. I, I know where it's coming from, right? And so once you get to that level, then you can bring it back in. When you bring try back in, you bring it in against their past people that they've worked with. So for example, say I'm working with you, you're the prospect. So tell me about the stuff that you tried in the past, right? The week was in the past, right? Tell me about the stuff you tried in the past. Oh, you know, I tried this, I tried that, okay. And the companies are like, what, what kind of gyms did you go to? I went to this gym, okay. And, and they were trying to get your results, and no matter what they tried, they couldn't get to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, okay, awesome. What are the stuff that you try? Right, you, you, you can do that. And then once they start feeling weak about the past, then you lift them up, okay? So you go, okay, it's gonna be a little different here. When you walk in this door, when you walk in this door, you will see a bunch of people that are getting results, and they're motivated to start kicking butt here. Okay? You will feel different in this gym because of that and the way the trainers will act with you. You will get those shoulders that you told me you wanted in the beginning of our conversation. 
you will be able to get those legs that we talked about. You will be able to fit into those dresses that you said you wanted to get back into. That will happen. You will be able to hike up that mountain. You will be able to run that mile. And you will be able to keep up with your kids. These things will not be a problem. I do this in my sleep for a living. This is not an issue. Will you do it? Now that person's got so much confidence built in the present versus the past. What do you think the likelihood is the person's going, I'm going to do it? They do it. Now for the occasional person that says, I think I can do it, you just go, think that you will. I will. It turns into it. It does. But you've got to understand there's a process to it. You can use this, but don't start doing this now. Because I promise you, this word is crazy. People say stuff like, I'm trying to think. You're thinking. I've tried to call them. You've called them. I'm trying to walk. You're walking. Like it's a stupid word. Think about it and call each other out on it. Okay, let's move on. But you, got, you guys understand weak words, right? Okay. Um, you know what? Actually, let me go back on this slide here. This is something that I want you guys to understand more than anything on how impactful it is. This is a story I like to tell. Anybody here a basketball fan like me? I freaking love basketball. Okay. So I want you to imagine you're the coach of a basketball team, and you just had the best season that you could have ever asked for. Your team kicked ass. Not only was, were you just running through the league all season, but you were feeling good, you were working together as a team, everything was flowing. It was really just you and this other team that were dominating the league the entire time. Everyone knew that it was going to come down to you two at the end of the year. Everyone knew it. Sure enough, you did. Championship game, it's down to you two. Back and forth, back and forth. You score, they score. You score, they score. You block it, they block it. You steal it, they steal it. Everyone's going nuts. Fans are at the edge of their seats. You don't know what's happening. You hardly breathe. You're the coach of this team, and here it is. A few seconds left. The other team's got the ball. They score. You're down by one with one second left. Every one of your fans is in the stands like this. All of your players on the bench are like this. Everyone's looking at you now to make the right call. Can you guys feel that right now? Everyone's looking at you. You call a timeout, you get in your huddle. You get all your guys and you look at the two guys that all season have been consistent. These two guys have been reliable and they've been making shots better than anybody else in the team with great confidence. You go to the first one. Chris, what do you think? And Chris goes, yeah, give me the ball. I'm going to try to make this one. And then you go, Mike. What do you think? Coach, give me the ball. I will make this shot. You're the coach. Who's getting the ball? Chris or Mike? Uh, say it loud. Mike. Mike. I like hearing my name just <laughs> <laughs> Mike's getting the ball. But why? You don't even know their stats. Technically, Mike has the same statistical likelihood of making or missing this shot, just like Chris does. The difference is Chris opened to failure. I just promised I'd try. Mike gave you a promise. You know he might mess up, and you're okay if he does, right? You're not going to be mad at him. Mike, you said you were going to make it. What the hell are you doing? You lied to me. <laughs> no, you're not going to say that. Neither will your people to you. As long as you know the real effort and care was there. Does that make sense? Yes. Talk with confidence, with complete conviction when you're in that sales mode. Don't leave open to, well, you know, as long as you know, none of that. I will. You will. Okay? When people say stuff like, I can't afford it, that is baloney. That is not true, and here's how I can prove it to you. People that say I can't afford to have a $1,000 phone in their pocket. <laughs> Could they afford a gym membership for a whole year in a lot of gyms if they have a 1000 bucks? Yes. People have flat screen TVs on their wall, probably several of them at home. Do they need them? No. We talked about the car. People pay more for what they want than what they need. You have to know that, because once you know that, you will never sell from need again. Never talk about... Well, it's important that you work out for longevity. We care about lifestyle and working out for longevity. You need to do this. It's important for a life. You need to. That's great. And no one's saying you're wrong. You are right. But you're, you got to know your demographic. You guys can say that to each other because this is your life. To the rest of the world, hey, they don't do what they need. They go to the dentist when? When they're two thirds. They go to the chiropractor when? They go to the doctor when? They go to their mommy when? Right? Like, some people go to Jesus when? Right? Like, when it gets to the point where I've got to do something because I'm in that much pain. 
okay? People don't do what they need as much as what they want, and for what they want, people make stupid decisions. I was in the debt side of an industry for about two years, about 12 years ago, and what I will tell you is people had credit card debt like I've never seen on the stupidest things. People that had $80,000, $90,000 in credit card debt had quads, jet skis, stupid. Right? But they don't have the job to pay for it. They don't have what they need, a job to pay for that. Okay? So for you guys, same thing. Even for you guys, think about it. Do you have a car that costs 60 grand that you could have done with 10 grand? Do you really want to think about it? And would that 50 grand do you better in that car for your business or in more advertising for this year? Which one do you need? And which one will get more cars later? Go for what you need, same thing. Once you believe that, you can get into your customers, okay? And this Apple Watch, silly. When I was in school, I never in my life, I can't think of a person that had a watch more expensive than 30 to 50 bucks, and that was pretty crazy. Now there's high schoolers in college. I was broke in college. Anybody broke in college? <laughs> college and high school are flooded with $400 watches with matching bands that they pay separately to match the outfits that they have because they want that. Who has an Apple Watch? Raise your hand. Now, keep your hand up if you really believe you need it. It is an important tool. How many of you raise your hand with, that you found out weeks later that actually it's worthless? Like, it doesn't do anything special. I don't have the time is BS2. 20 years ago, people said they didn't have the time. 20 years ago, people said they didn't have the time to get in shape. Guess what? If you checked out this stat dropped by Netflix, actually before, I'm gonna ask you guys, how many hours a week do you think the average person spends? The average. Do you mind people that never watch it? There's people that always watch it. How many hours do you think the average person spends a week watching Netflix? You guys expect higher than what it is. I was surprised with 10. But it is 10. Now let me ask you, how many hours a week does somebody need to come work out of your gym to get good results? Three? So what you're saying is, the average person has enough time to get good results at your gym and still watch seven series on Netflix every week? <laughs> is that crazy? Is that, is that an ad? <laughs> good idea, Layla, can I have this? This is a YouTube ad now. <laughs> but do you guys see what I'm saying? So once you can believe it's BS, you won't stand for their shit. Keep forgetting if I can or can't. I still get my body bold and they were like, nothing. You know, we can't even say crap. I'm like, all right, all right. But you get what I'm saying, right? So what you gotta believe at first so you can call them out. Now when it comes to internet leads, this is where I need honesty and I need participation. Agreed? Okay, I need you to raise your hand if you've said any of these phrases about the internet leads or anybody on your team has said any of these phrases. Because I hear them, Alex hears them, and any great marketer hears them too. So, have you or anyone on your team said, the leads are weak? <laughs> keep them up. If you, if you say it, keep them up. You're strong enough to keep your arms up. I know the demographic. <laughs> the leads aren't quality. These people aren't serious. It's starting to collect. These people don't have money. They never answer the phone. Uh, good one on that one. I can tell when they call, they're not a good fit. Now keep your hands up. If you put them up once, keep them up. Look around the room. Okay. Now, everyone that didn't raise your hand, put your hands up. Everybody else put your hands down. A few people. The point is, some people aren't saying that. But here's what I will say. For all of you guys in the room that want to feel normal, you're right. I'm not going to argue with you. You're 100% right. They're internet leads, and they are very, very weak. That's okay you could push a button and get it without turning off all your other stuff, right? No one says we're trading this for member referrals. No one says we're trading this for walk-ins. No one says we're trading this for you setting up booths and building partnerships and relationships. Are we? We're adding to the funnel. Now I'm gonna show you some really crazy things that are coming up here that hopefully help, hopefully help you see marketing the way people that study marketing see leads. Because once you do, I promise you, your whole mindset of these leads are gonna change. Is that okay? Uh, sir, what do you do for a living? Yeah, you own a gym. So I'm guessing if you own a gym, if a person that hasn't worked out in 15 or 20 years, they're probably pretty weak, would you agree? Hasn't worked out, done anything physical 15, 20 years. 
If they come into your gym, you can make them stronger. Yes or no? That's awesome. How? What would you do? Make them work out. Strength training, okay. Conditioning, nutrition stuff. Nutrition, okay, cool. Sounds good. Would you guys agree those things are imperative to getting them stronger? Everyone seems to know that. Okay. So what you're saying is, sir, I just want to understand. So strength training, nutrition, and like, you know, uh, conditioning, that kind of stuff, right? So I take my seven-year-old daughter, who's never studied fitness, and I can say, hey, baby, all you got to do is write up a good uh, workout program, strength training program, tell them what to eat, and then like help them do some stuff like conditioning, like some kind of exercise stuff. So she can go and write stuff. I'm guessing she'll put like jumping jacks and push-ups. I'm guessing she'll put apples and bananas and stuff like that. And I'm guessing she'll say, like, run around the block or something or ride your bike. So what you're saying is because those things are being done by both people, technically she'll get that guy as strong as you'll get. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Obviously not. Really, that's interesting. It's the same stuff, isn't it? On a high level, it's the same thing. Because it's not what you do, it's how you do it. you got the science behind it. Is that right? Okay. No, you're right. I'm not arguing with you. Getting a person that's already physically fit, strong, incredible shape to come in and work out at your gym, and then you take credit for his results, doesn't mean you're a good trainer. It means you're a property owner that just happens to have a gym on that property and he came in and used it, right or wrong. Right. Yeah. Oh, getting a strong lead to buy from you doesn't mean you're a good salesperson. It means you're an order taker. Does that make sense? Improve your sales skills, just like you've improved your fitness skills, and the lead somehow gets stronger. Does that make sense? Yeah. Am I crazy? Okay. So really what it comes down to is you guys really, all the stuff that you did, what are some things that you did to learn what you learned? Did you, were you born with this stuff? You came out of the womb knowing protein and carbs and how many grams and all that stuff. Did you know that? YouTube videos. That's it? Just YouTube videos? Podcasts? Courses? School? Books? Networking with other trainers, trial and error, time and experience, yes or no? What do you think is going to be different about sales? Put in the same work that you put in with your fitness knowledge that you did for sales, I promise you, you will be able to make the leads look stronger than the other guy. Would you guys agree that that makes a lot of sense? Okay. I'm not going to lie to you and tell you that the internet leads are the best you can get, because they are not. But, like I said, you can push a button and get results. Here's some stats that you should know. 2% of sales are made on the first contact. So if you feel like when the people call and you talk to them on the phone, they're not a good fit or blah, 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 whatever on that first call, that's not that the leads are weak. That's that it's normal. It's not a you thing. I've got that. Alex has that. Uh, maybe not Alex. 3% of sales are made on the second contact. More than 80% of sales are made between the 5th and 12th contact. But get ready for this stupid statistic. More than 80% of sales people admit they quit contacting people before the 5th contact. Could you see that happening in a lot of places? Does it make sense that sales aren't being made? And, and, and is it crazy? If you're a marketer and you know these things, could you see yourself getting irritated when people say, we need marketing to do better? It's like, dude, just know the numbers. Once you know the numbers, then we can play. We're all in the same arena. These are the numbers. How many of you guys watched the game the other day? Okay, say boo if you don't like Tom Brady. Boo. Now give me a good cheer if you like him. Yeah. I just want to know the room. It doesn't really matter to me. I like the guy. I think he is the GOAT, right? But let's talk about, huh? Yeah, that's, hey, that's cool. Hey, opinions matter, right? So what I want you guys to <laughs> what I want you guys to know is that Tom Brees is a scientist on the field. Do you believe that Tom Brees knows the game of football? What did I say? Damn it, you messed me up. <laughs> Why don't you come get the player? <laughs> you know what? Both of them know the game of football. But would you agree that Tom Brady knows the game of football? Would you guys agree that? The guy knows his numbers and the stats behind different plays and situations. Yes, he knows. So when he gets in the position that he was in, which I feel like is every freaking game that matters, 
where it's like he gets the ball with like a minute or two left, and he's got to make a play right now. This is it. How many of you guys have been in a situation in your business where you're like, I need to make sales this month. This is an important month. It's make or break month. Raise your hands. Okay, here you go. This is your drive. This is your Tom Brady drive. Now, Tom Brady gets the ball. Do you think right now he goes, guys, first down, I'm launching this thing. You guys just run to the end. I'm going to throw a Hail Mary, catch it. I believe this is how it's going to work. <laughs> you think that's what he does? Touchdown, throw, first down, first play, and a minute or two left? Is that what he does? What does he do? Chops, 10 yards. Chops, 6 yards. Chops, 18 yards. And he chops, and he chops, and he gets further down the field. And he keeps going all the way till he gets to the part where it's 30 yards left. And everyone knows, the commentators know, the fans know, the competition knows, what's Brady about to do now? He's going to score. Everyone knows. But if he's so good, why don't he just launch it from all the way on the other end of the field? Because he was so far down the funnel. I mean field. Sorry. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So he's so far down that this is a long shot, and the stats say this is stupid and don't expect to score. And if you expect to score, it's because you do not know the game of football. My best play, build rapport. Get a little further. Micro commitment. Know about his kids. Get him a little more involved. Get him to come down again. Chop them down. Chop them down. Chop them down. Who cares if you don't? Tom Brady's not looking to score in the first 10 seconds. If you close a guy three weeks from the day the lead was generated, is that still good? If you close him two months later, is that still good? If you close him next year, is that still good? How cool is it when you make a sale out of nowhere and it's a guy that you actually found last year and it came out of nowhere? Aren't those like the best days where like, dude, this guy from like a year ago came in and bought today? Okay, so chop him down. Don't go for the long shot. Understand the game, understand the stats. Be the Tom Brady. I want you to look at internet leads differently. There's short game goals, which is lead generation, right? That's what you guys are playing at the front end of this whole thing. Okay? These all have a goal of just generating high volume. That's it. You just want to get a lot of them. A few leads a day. Some of you have the budget and the location. Or maybe you can get 10 or 15 a day. It all depends on your location, your budget. There's a lot of variables, right? Marketing's like that. There's no standard. These leads are early in the funnel, just like Brady's early in the field. Okay? They do need to be worked, and they do not close themselves. Marketing does not make sales. Sales make sales. Marketing generates opportunities. That's it. Okay? So those are your cold leads. We all know about cold leads now. We've talked about it a little, but I'm going to dive in a little more into some cool stuff. But let's talk about the things that everyone loves, which is hot leads. How many of you guys love when a hot lead comes into your database? Raise your hand. Now, a hot lead can only come from one place. What is it? Referral. From who? Member, right? You get a member referral, and it's the hottest lead you can get. In fact, that's, that's it. That's it. There's only one type of hot lead. Everything else is warm. We'll get into that. So it's hot lead. So that, you can only get a few member referrals. But here's the deal. You know how many people I've sat down with, and I'm like, hey, so tell me about your sales closing ratio. Tell me about your ratio. Oh, dude, if I get them in front of me, I close 9 out of 10. I hear that all the time. If I get in front of me, I close everyone. I close 9 out of 10. That's great. Where do you get your leads from? Now, this guy hasn't marketed yet. All referrals. He says that with arrogance because he knows that means I'm good at what I do. Right? He's, he's talking about the service. I'm off that. I'm talking about your marketing and sales ability. So he goes, oh, all referrals. All referrals? And you close 9 out of 10? What happened to the one? <laughs> How'd you mess that up? <laughs> they already knew the price. They probably knew, they knew a guy worked out there. They probably knew the schedule. They probably knew everything. They asked this guy all the questions. All you had to do was sign the guy up. Would you do smoke a cigarette and blow it in his face? How'd you drop it? <laughs> right? Closing over a hot lead has nothing to do with your ability to sell. It has your ability, it has to do with your ability to just write shit down. Okay? Closing the cold leads is what matters. Hot leads come from member referrals, that's it. The goal is to get more cold members, cold leads, to become members. Because I want you to look at it as, I'm not just getting members, I'm getting hot lead generators. If hot leads can only come from members, well, let's do the math. 
if you have 500 members and you have 100 members and everything in your business is as far as skill and quality is equal, who has a likelihood of getting more referrals that month? You. That's it. So guys, spend as much as you can. Dude, the leads are only closing 8%. Spend double. Spend more. You don't chop down on that. Hey, let's get more of them. Because there's some cool stuff that comes along with that too, and I'll break that down. The long game goals. The long game goals are cold leads. Yes, we got that. Bringing us hot leads. Good, closing these two. But then we've got the warm leads, meaning familiarity and trust. So you guys have probably opted into something of Alex's first, and maybe, or maybe not, you called them on that first opt-in. And you just wanted a guy or see a case study or something like that. But then you kept seeing more of him, right? How many of you guys filled out something, but then he took a few more things, a few more videos, and then ultimately you called him? Raise your hands. Okay, that comes with familiarity, that's your warm leads. This is also people that say stuff like, how many of you guys have had this? You know what? I, I, Drive to work every day, and I've, I've been seeing your gym, and I've always wanted to go in, and I figured, why not? Today, today I come in. How many of you guys had it before? Or I've heard people talk about it, or yeah, I know a buddy of mine's worked out here before. You said good things, right? So those are warm leads. Those aren't hot leads. Those are warm leads. Okay, we want those too. You got to get that by creating content. That's consistent impressions, guys. You're in your business. You know what I hate? Every marketer and advertiser hates this. That actually is good. The dumb ones actually talk the same language, but. The good ones, what they talk, uh, what they hate is the talk of ROIs. Everyone's all about, what's the ROI? What's the ROI? We'll talk about the ROI. The ROI on what? The front end of your phone? Right now, I, how many of you guys understand that when you first start your business, dude, let's put everything into it. Everything. I'm not supposed to be rich year one. I'm supposed to make my company, I'm supposed to put everything into here. So for me, I'm wanting every, my job is to get everyone and anyone in my five to seven mile radius to know who I am, what I do, why I do it, why I'm better, why my customers choose me, what they get out of it, and I need to saturate it. And it's easy because you're competing against small business owners that technically don't know what they're doing. It's like being a UFC fighter and going into a bar and fighting a guy that just watches UFC. <laughs> Just become the UFC fighter, not the fan. Become the advertiser, not the fan. And you will just destroy people. Because you don't have to do what Alex and I do. We have to go countrywide or, or, or worldwide with our advertising. You guys, just five miles. That's it. Blow up that five miles, right? And you want to do it on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, all that. But keep in mind, start with one. Really get it, really just nail it down. Get it down really good before you move on to the next one. Don't wanna do everything because you're gonna get overwhelmed, you're gonna get frustrated. Unless you've got a team where you can really do that, it means I have to start with one, dominate it, move on. But here's the thing I want you to know. Even if you break even on your advertising, whether it's on your own, with Alex, whatever, even if you break even or lose a little ROI along the way, that's fine. And I'll tell you why. Look at it as, along the way, you're building five very important and amazing things for free for extremely cheap, these things. You're building your chatbot list. You're building your text list. You're building your phone list. You're building your email list. You're building your retargeting list. Guys, I promise business gets easier when these lists get built. <coughs> Companies, brands pay money to get cold versions of all these lists. They pay to get them. You are getting them at a discount and or for free and or you're getting paid to acquire them, depending on your sales skills. If your sales skills are good, you're getting all these things while getting paid to get them. So if you only close 10% of your leads, you're getting 90% of them all in here because this is something important to know. You want to stay in front of them until they're ready. See, you guys are fitness professionals. We've talked about this. What that means is fitness is a part of your routine. It's like brushing your teeth. How many of you feel off if you've gone two days in a row without working out? Raise your hands. You know, that's not normal outside of this room. <laughs> There's people that go six months and go, I haven't worked out in, I think it's been like, was it on the cruise at that gym? <laughs> We didn't even work out. We were just drinking margaritas on the bench. I know. I, I think that's the last time I've been in the gym. Like, that's normal. You know that, right? 
Don't get brainwashed and think everyone out there is like you or they're picking between you and another gym. They're picking between you and Netflix and every other stupid thing that doesn't get them in shape, even though that's what they really want. This is what the rest of the world looks like. We're in really bad shape. So the average person goes through nine, uh, the average woman, sorry. The average woman starts up a diet nine times a year. Whether it's the same one or a different one, right? Whether she's repeating something she failed at, besides she's wondering, the average woman starts up a diet nine times a year. That means they're what nine times a year? Ready nine times a year. I get it. You guys are ready for your leads to buy now, but it's about when they're ready. They're not on your level with fitness, okay? Nike, for example, Nike always runs branding ads, always. And they're always ready to sell you sneakers. All of you guys go to their site right now, I promise you, if you want sneakers, you'll get them. You go to the Nike store right now, you want sneakers, you'll get them. Guarantee it, they're always ready to sell you sneakers. But they understand that you may not want or need a new pair of sneakers right now. So, they'll stay in front of you until then. And when that time comes, and you walk into the store to get shoes, how many of you guys have a brand, whether it is Nike or Under Armour or whatever, that when you walk into the store, you gravitate to that section first before even considering the other options? How many of you guys do that? Why? Isn't that crazy? Because when you think about it, how many of you guys are running enthusiasts? Any of you? Most running enthusiasts will tell you that Nike is not the best running shoe. Have you guys heard that before? They have the best marketing. Coffee connoisseurs will tell you that Starbucks does not make the best coffee, but they have the best marketing. IT professionals will tell you that Apple does not offer the best technology, but they have the best marketing. Consistency with brand awareness trains the mind of the consumer to build extreme trust. The goal is to be well known in your area. That's it. Just hit them over and 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 over. Because when that time comes, when they're ready, you're the only one they can think of. What's that? I was under there. The obvious choice when someone's ready. That's the goal. And you do that by constantly staying in front of them with content throughout that radius. There is no relation between being good and getting paid. But there is definitely a relationship between being good at marketing and getting paid. Joe Polish said this is one of my favorite quotes. How many of you guys know that there's probably amazing restaurants that went out of business? Mm -hmm. How many of you guys know that there's crappy restaurants that are killing it right now? McDonald's. <laughs> Great marketing. So one of my mentors is this guy, Jordan Zimmerman. He owns an agency worth $4.4 billion. He took over all of McDonald's advertising. And when I asked him, how do you sell McDonald's when they got so much stuff like, what, what's that movie, the documentary? The super size and all this stuff, how do you do it? And he goes, you gotta find the unique advantage. Do you know that McDonald's is the only fast food chain that serves breakfast with a real egg? Look at your face, what did you just do? Everyone look at him, what did your face just do? Good. Look, you just actually go, oh, that's protein now, I got it. Cool. <laughs> That's all you want. Marketing is about getting attention. Did I get your attention? That's it. A great marketer knows that. It's not about just offers. What's the unique thing? What's my competitive advantage? Alex wanted me to talk about being the mayor of the city. Right, that, make, that means doing all the things to make sure that not only do people know you because of online, but get out there. Get out there because they work together, not independently. Your marketing is amazing when they see something online, when they see you online, and they also saw you in person. They're like, oh, that's the guy. I just saw him. Or when they see you in person, and they go, dude, I see you online. It's like this weird next level feeling. How many of you guys have seen speakers say that you see them online, and then you see them in person, you're like, oh, that's kind of cool. Or vice versa, when you see someone in person, and then later on you see them online, you're like, oh, that's the guy. I got your attention. So don't just think of it as, well, internet marketing, I'm already doing that. Do that, do everything. Get out there. Orange Theory, they have a goal to open up their studios with over 500 members, and many of them do it. 500 paying members. How do they do it? They build partnerships. They go to all the different um, uh, businesses that are around them, and they offer all the employees charter memberships. 
They offer all the people that work there, the, the owners, everybody, charter memberships. They also go down to physical therapists and acupuncturists and massage therapists and martial arts schools and everything and everywhere where their prospects are, might already be congregating and they want to build a partnership with them and they offer them charter memberships. They do this stuff and guess what? It works. They've opened up over a thousand locations and have yet to close one down. Isn't that crazy? This part's very important, the very beginning. But here's one thing that's really cool. Once they open, it's not a pre-sale strategy. It is an ongoing thing. They continue to offer things. They continue to become what's called the mayor of the city. Does that make sense? Now, as far as developing partnerships, this is where marketing comes in really cool. Um, I, I, you, you do marketing online, clearly, right? Like you're already marketing online. So you've probably started to recognize other businesses in your area that need you marketing online too, right? So I want you guys to imagine. Imagine that you're going, okay, cool, I want to develop some strategic partnerships, like chiropractors, for instance, right? Because chiropractors may say the reason your back is this way is because you need to strengthen up your core, you need to do some more strength training, you're not that limber, right? There's certain things like that. So building relationships with these guys makes a lot of sense. So I want you to imagine you've got two chiropractors in this scenario, you know nothing about them other than what I'm going to show you. You got two chiropractors you can choose from. You got this guy here, okay? And you've never seen him before. You've never met him before. And then you've got this guy here, and everywhere you go, you see him. Which one do you want to partner with? Which one do you want to build a referral partnership with? You can only pick one. Pick one. Mr. Jones, Dr. Jones? Clearly. Well, how do you, the guy on the left in the wonderful red turtleneck could easily have 15,000 patients that love him and do anything he says. The other guy, Dr. Jones, could easily be a guy that just started his business six months ago and learned that he needed to advertise and he's got some money. But the perception is real. Your perception is this guy. This guy's going to be part. I need to send him business. Barbara's process will kick in, right? So advertise, knowing that you're also hitting up all your other people that you can have that, that, that are on your preferred vendors as well. Even if you can get them on a retargeting list by sending out these people stuff just to get them to a landing page that has a retargeting pixel on it. So now forever they can just see your shit. And then little by little, they're like, I gotta work with this guy. I gotta work with this guy. Great, good. Here's how it starts. Send me some business so I know you're for real. Cool. You want to find a way to make noise. Bang your own drum. I understand huff humility, being humble. We all want to do it because, again, the world has taught us that we need to be in our box. Don't make. Don't be so outlandish. Don't be so this. Don't be so that. Look, relax. You're a business owner now. You have an obligation to your employees to sometimes be a little annoying. You have an you have an obligation to your team and to everyone that supported you along the way to bang your own drum, and to maybe annoy people, and think that maybe, oh, this guy's ego, look at, look at him, look where he's at, look, forget that. Don't even worry about what people say. You get out there, and you make noise, and you talk, and you teach. And don't teach thinking that, well, these other trainers are gonna watch it, I'm not saying anything new. Forget about anything new. I'm not, if I'm a competitor of yours, I'm not looking to impress you anyway. I'm looking to teach this woman, my actual prospect, something. What's the difference between good cards and bad cards? What's the difference between simple carbs and complex carbs? What's the difference between good fats or trans fats, saturated fats? What's, what kind of protein is good protein? The truth behind being vegan. Whatever. Oh, but everyone knows that already. There's content. Yeah, well then why do these people keep asking you that? Do you get these questions all the time? What time should I work out? What's the, should I eat before going to bed? What's great for breakfast? Have you heard all these? So who cares if the content's out? You see it all the time for two reasons. One, because whenever you get a car, you see that car everywhere. You guys are in fitness, so you know it's fitness. And two, because you're probably being retargeted, retargeted in the algorithm knows you like fitness stuff. The average person isn't seeing fitness stuff, and if she is, she's not noticing it. So they ask you this stuff. So you hit them over and over and over until you get through to them and you teach them something. And then that face that you made, huh? It's the face they made, huh? And you're the one that made it. Content's important. Find a way to make noise. Create a little controversy, that's okay. Don't worry about it. We have no problem being controversial in the game of sports, the game of business, sometimes that's necessary as well. <laughs> Don't be afraid to do crazy things. Uh, how many of you guys watch this movie? You're gonna show me. Yeah. It's an amazing movie, but this guy's story was told, like there, there's so much more. This is like 100 years from now, our great grandkids are talking and somebody goes, 
did you see the movie about that Michael Jordan guy? And the other guy goes, the other kid goes, no, what happened? Dude, this guy played baseball for like the Barons. He was amazing. And then you like are in heaven going like, no, no, there was much more. He did a lot. He was amazing. Right? This guy, he didn't look like this. He actually didn't even start the circus until he was like in his 60s. That's really what he was looking like. And this guy, yeah, he's the greatest showman. But to biz business people, he's known as the greatest advertiser that ever lived. But to him, he saw no difference. He knew that it was about creating a show and getting attention. He did things like to get people in his museum. He had the man-eating chicken. Come down and watch the man-eating chicken. And people would get in line, and he had lines, because never, no one's ever seen this thing. Everyone wanted to see it. Lines to come in. They have to go through this entire museum. They've never been through before. They're looking at all this stuff, and they're amazed. Wow, look at this. Mermaid, and this, and this, and this. And then they get to the end. Finally, they get to see the man-eating chicken, and they see a man-eating chicken. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they loved it, because they got valuable along the way. They were in a place where you made throughout the experience along the way. He also did this one cool thing where he said, all right, guys, he put this all out there. He said, I'm going to create traffic with my mind on a street that never has traffic. Come watch me do it. I would be staring out a window, creating traffic simply with my mind. And so he sat out the window, and he gave me time, and people started flooding in, and people started flooding in. Next thing you know, the streets were packed. And everyone started laughing. Holy shit, he just created traffic <laughs> with an idea that came from his mind. Isn't that cool? See, back then, he wasn't flooded with so many ideas in social media. So he was actually thinking. And I think sometimes we need to just think sometimes uh, as well. Richard Branson, last story, because I know my time's almost up. I love following this guy. This guy loves controversy, but he does it in such a playful way. So if you guys know Richard Branson, kind of like Virgin Airlines, Virgin Airlines, all that stuff. So British Airways is one of his main competitors, okay? And, uh, you know, they're always going back and forth. In fact, British Airways were a little bigger. So British Airways also, understanding marketing and making noise and getting out there, he decided, we're going to create this big Ferris wheel, biggest Ferris wheel, be right by the airport. So when planes are flying in, they'll see British Airways. And then they'll want to come in to do the, the, the Ferris wheel. And then when they come to the Ferris wheel, they're up to the top, they can see the planes taking off. And we can keep these things going back and forth. We can get the Ferris wheel, we can give them promos, we can give them specials and all this stuff. It's going to be amazing. And yes, it was a great idea. They did they build a really big Ferris wheel, but they didn't have the technology to actually get it to stand up. They couldn't figure it out. They brought in architects, they brought in engineers, they couldn't get the freaking thing up. Nobody knew what to do now, because you build it on the side. And Richard Branson goes, huh. And he actually got a blimp, rented it, and flew it above the Ferris wheel with the phrase on it, BA can't get it up. <laughs> That blimp made the paper more than the Ferris wheel ever did. Now, no one's saying you have to do that, and this is just a silly example, but I mean, think about like little crazy things. Again, silly example, just to get something twisted, but what if Joe's gym, your competition, was closed on Sundays, and you just floated a hot air balloon, and it said, Joe's gym, closed, open on Sundays, right? Real estate in the air is free. Now keep in mind, hot air balloons are a little crazy. But if you do need a hot air balloon, this is my affiliate link. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But if you do go to that link, I did create something cool for you. Um, and there's a hot air balloon, and there's a testimonial from Alex Hermosi, who actually uh, rented a hot air balloon from hotairspromo.com. <laughs> Seriously, we made a landing page last night. <laughs> um, Guys, that's my time for today. Um, my, uh, my name is Mike Arce. I'm the CEO and founder of Loud Rumor. Um, we won Best Place to Work in 2016. Uh, my team's here. They're awesome. And uh, I'm the host of Top Fitness Business Podcast, the GSD Show. If you guys haven't downloaded it yet, download it. We're bringing it back here. Uh, we were off on a, on a break here, but we're bringing it back next month, and it's freaking awesome. And then uh, also we had an awesome conference called the G uh, GSD Con. Anybody know what GSD stands for? Thank God, we're in the right crowd. I like to Alex's crowd. So get shit done. So we got GSD Con. Awesome speakers. In fact, Alex is coming down to come and speak too. So that's going to be great. And um, you guys have all got this on your table right now, Fitness Marketing Secrets. You know what's crazy? I feel like I want, I want to explain this. Alex wrote a secrets book, and I wrote a secrets book, and we didn't know until we released the secrets book. And so it just shows that great minds think alike. And so now I'm going to just do it. I'm calling it out right now. Alex. 
I am interviewing you for my next Secrets book. Is that okay? Yes? Is that, is that okay? Rock of applause for all of us. It's not about being the guy, it's about helping the people, and I'll take as many Alex's on my team as I can get. Um, a lot of these strategies you can find on different articles and entrepreneur and forums and you know, a bunch of cool places. There's podcasts I've been featured on you guys can go check out that are really cool. I go into uh, um, pricing strategies and all this cool stuff I think you guys can find value in. And again, those are the links. Thank you guys very much. Appreciate your time.